Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm really pleased to have with me once again fund manager, hedge fund manager Dave Kranzler. And uh, I'm not going to waste time reading his bio now because we've read it before, but uh, I would like to remind those of you who may not be familiar with David's background. It's a very impressive background. You can read about it at on my page at the Voice America Business Channel. Uh, and I would say, better yet, go to investmentresearchdynamics.com, investmentresearchdynamics.com, to learn more about uh, about Dave Kranzler, as well as uh, read his very interesting commentary and the commentary of others that is posted there. Uh, a great insights in terms of the markets and uh, related geopolitics, I think. Uh, very, very valuable, very worth your time going there. I enjoy David's commentary uh, almost daily and uh, just sort of want to pass it along to you, and that's why we have him on the show again. Thanks for joining me again, David. Thanks for having me, Jay. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Always good to have your thoughts uh, and your insights into the markets. Today, of course, the big news coming out of China, the People's Bank of China downgrading or, let's say, revaluing uh, uh, the, uh, the currency by just a little under 2% uh, vis-a-vis the dollar, uh, you know, it's not much of a move, as our previous guest was saying. The, the Japanese yen has depreciated 30 percent over the last year, I think it was, and the uh, and the euro by 25 percent vis-a-vis the dollar. So a two percent move. Uh, you know, wonder what's uh, what's this all about? Of course, the Chinese had been uh, keeping their their currency pretty well pegged to the U.S. dollar, and and maybe it's the potential for much bigger moves ahead that has the markets roiled. But what are your thoughts on it? Do you, and do, you, do you have any sort of insights into what might be going on beyond what we've heard in the mainstream press today? Yeah, this is a great topic. I mean, it's. I, I think the press in general, the talking heads on TV, have kind of given this superficial attention here. Um, and I did some thinking about it this morning, and then I tried to Google around and see if I could find other and analysis of it. And there really isn't much on the internet, but you you hit the nail on the head. It's it's not so much about the the 1.9 percent reval that happened last night. It's the fear that this is symbolic of the currency war, in which we're basically in a currency war that's a global race to zero. And a lot of guys were warning about this in the early 2000s, as I'm sure you recall. Sure. And it's taken a lot longer for it to happen than I would have thought. I would have thought that where we are now is where we would have been five or six years ago. Well, we were on that path until they started QE. But um, I think the market is is fearing more of this from China. And really what China is doing here is, is they're, they're bracing for impact. That is to say their economy is is basically collapsing Mm -hmm. but i don't i don't see that's what everyone focuses on and it irritates me when when the media the financial media and the wall street monkeys get on tv and they talk about how bad china is how bad europe is how bad japan is well guess what (laughs) the u.s isn't in any better shape than any of these other countries especially when you when you analyze through the headline propaganda economic reports like that the employment report that we just saw. So mm-hmm. to me, it's China acknowledging, yeah, you know, the world is, is headed for a deep depression. We're bracing for impact. We're going to devalue our currency so that we can try and stimulate our manufacturing exports as much as possible. They've mm-hmm. been slowly letting the bubble out of their huge financial bubble. I mean, every day I wake up, all I see is the Fed and, and the government trying to keep our bubbles re- inflated or inflate them even more. So, and also, you know, most importantly, China's obviously accumulating a lot of gold, a lot more gold than they're willing to disclose to the world. So, so I, I, what I see is I see China getting their country and their economic system ready for what's coming. And, and to me, it's basically an economic torpedo that they fired at the United States, and that's why the stock market's tanking today. Mm-hmm. We were expecting China to behave the way we wanted to for our interest and not necessarily theirs, I guess. That's exactly right. Well, I, you know, go ahead. Oh, one thing that always gets lost in the shuffle, and I was actually chatting with, with Dr. Paul Craig Roberts about this last night, 
One thing that, that people don't overlook is the fact that China has a $3.6 trillion foreign currency reserve slush fund. The U.S. doesn't have that. If you go and you look at what the U.S. foreign currency reserves are, it's something like $32 billion, and, it, <laughs> and it declines on a daily basis. So not, and not only do they have the foreign currency reserve slush fund, they just increase the value of it in terms of yuan, but also they obviously have a lot of gold, and we don't know how much gold the U.S. and Europe have left. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a mystery. But a moment ago, Dave, you know, you said that you made the point that China has been accumulating a lot more gold than they're letting on. You know, most people, as you call them the Wall Street monkeys that we see on, on uh, mainstream television, would say, so what? what? What's gold mean? What's gold have to do with anything? Talk to our listeners and maybe make that clear. I'm sure a lot of our listeners understand it. But what's going on here, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, gold transferring from the West. I mean, this is, as James Turk has always pointed out, Gold follows wealth, where wealth is being created and it runs away from poverty. It runs away from indebtedness and so forth. So we're seeing this transfer of gold to the, to the, uh, from the west to the east. China, India importing huge amounts of gold, as they have been inclined to do. But more recently, China more rapidly, and Russia too, the BRIC countries, if you will. And, of course, you know, it was just recently, uh, was it just a week or two ago that the IMF uh, basically slapped China in the face again and said, no, you're not ready to be a member of our exclusive SDR club. Uh, get out of here, essentially. Do you think what's going on today or what the Chinese have done might be related? And, and might? how does gold fit into this whole, whole picture, if you would care to comment on that? That's actually a, a great question. And um, just real quickly, I, I do think that um, what China did last night was was sort of a a message of their disappointment over the IMF, which really means the U.S. turning them down to have yeah. the, the yuan as part of the the IMF SDR. Um, but I mean, we're in a period now, it's a little over forty years, where the world has not been on a gold standard. And it's, I think it's one of the longest periods in five thousand years of, of of history where there hasn't been a gold standard. And it clearly doesn't work. And I, I think what's going to happen is, is as the, as the economic power of the world shifts from the west to the east, I think that a gold standard is going to be reinstated. And what it's going to allow China to do, especially if they basically, I mean, they're basically the economic 600-pound gorilla now. They're the largest importer, the largest exporter. They have a huge population for, for to fuel their own economy, plus they've spent the better part of the last 10 years diversifying their exports away from the U.S. and, and into the regional economies around them. So um, I, think, I think reinstating a gold standard or, or re, you know, rolling out a gold back one will sort of be the last sort of move. It'll sort of be the checkmate that will transfer – economic and political power from the U.S., the NATO bloc, and specifically the U.S., into China. And, and I, think that's, I think that's what's going on there. And, I mean, imagine this scenario, because this is one that I've always thought about for, you know, 10 years. Let's say China decides to roll out a gold-backed currency, and they say, okay, and they don't have to have the reserve currency. It doesn't have to be a reserve currency. All they uh -huh. have to do is say, okay, this is our currency, and if you want to trade with us, you either have to convert your currency into our currency, or you have to demonstrate that you your currency has gold backing. And we yeah. want we want proof. I right. mean, where's that going to leave the United States? Yeah, if you want to sell to us, you got to give us. Uh, you know, you, you you have to if you're going to buy from us, you have to prove that you have that you you have some worthy currency to pay us with. Right. If you want to buy from us and use your currency and convert it into ours, we need to know that your currency is backed by gold. Right. Otherwise, you need to go out into the market and, and exchange your currency for our currency and then trade with us. And they can do that without making their, their currency the official reserve currency. Yeah. They're just saying, hey, if you want to buy our, our electronic products, you, you got to use a gold-backed currency. And you need to show us that yours is gold-backed. Otherwise, you got to convert into ours. Yeah. yeah. 
You know, and if, if that were to happen and the U.S. said, well, no, you just we have our gold. It's been 8,100 tons since 1971, and that's what it is. And, and, and China would say, well, fine, go convert your currency into our currency in the marketplace. I guarantee you it would just crush the value of the dollar. Yeah. Yeah, well, that that explains, Dave, how the you know how that how that transfer could uh, you know how could matter uh, if China went on a gold currency because you know I think that's probably what people aren't really really connecting and understanding. So thank you for that explanation. I think it helps to clarify you know what China does is important and uh, in in that regard because they are such an important exporter and uh, you know how much uh, how much would we have to pay. Uh, for the uh, for the imports of of electronic uh, equipment and other things that we buy from China, if uh, if all of a sudden uh, that market disappeared from us, there's a China doesn't want it to disappear e- either. But on the other hand, they want to get paid in something that's that's a value and not the uh, not these worthless, increasingly worthless dollars. Which, of course, I believe, and I, you can tell me if you agree or not. To a great extent, the dollar is underpinned by our military, our military-industrial complex. You, I think you probably agree with that, right, David? No question about it. I mean, that's the only way that I can ever imagine that the U.S. was able to convince the world in in 1971 to take our dollars without a gold backing. Mm-hmm. Because and at a- that point in time, the U.S. was one of two superpowers, and arguably, probably even back then, the biggest superpower over and above Russia. So there's no yeah. question the dollar's backed by military might rather than economic might. Yeah, and it seems as though we have to continue uh, going along that path in order to retain uh, the dollar as a reserve currency, which sort of leads me to the Ukraine. Issues come out of the Ukraine today. There's a big big bit of news today about how there were Ukrainian hackers uh, that tapped into some of the uh, to, to some of the news media in the United States, the uh, purveyors of uh, corporate uh, corporate news, uh, in order to these guys getting inside information before it hits the market, and then place their bets in various equities and I suppose bonds as well, based on that news. In other words, insider trading that they gained through hacking in the United States. Not only uh, not only the um, uh, the securities uh, part of the United States government, but also. Homeland Security is, seems to be getting very interested in these Ukrainian hackers. I don't know if you followed this story or not, Dave, but any any idea about how that may play into this whole mix of of uh, geopolitics? Because I think geopolitics is, is something Americans don't think much about, but I think it's so important if you follow what's going on with our with our geopolitical moves around the world and uh, the Ukraine, of course, Russia. Uh, and the Ukraine, where we seem to be at war, although we've backed away from the rhetoric recently against Putin to the extent we had been engaging. Any any thoughts on that? What might be going on there with that Ukrainian news today, if you followed it? Well, I, I missed that news story. Um, but, I mean, when I hear something like that, my initial reaction is, okay, how credible is the news source? Mm-hmm. And... What would be what would be the motive for planting a news source like that? And and to me, it's the same thing. When we got that news, I think it was on Friday or Saturday morning that some Soviets or some Russians had hacked into the Pentagon yeah. computer system. And it, you know, it was just kind of like, oh, okay. Well, I guess we're supposed to believe that Russia shot down mh17 or whatever the numbers were on that plane i mean it's, yeah. I, I don't know to what extent there's there's a lot of there's a lot of false reporting that's being planted in the media and and to me when i see something about ukrainian hackers hacking into our our news sources so they can get inside information well if the ukrainians can do it that then you're you know that means that wall streeters are doing it all the time <laughs> so and that, then that would not even make it real news. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, and if it's Ukrainians, it might not be Russian. It might not be uh, Ukrainians that are sympathetic to Putin, but could be on our side. Right, so exactly. So Daniel I, McAdams. I didn't see the article, so I don't know yeah. who they're attributing well, I, I, to the Ukrainians to. But Yeah, well, they, on television today, they marched out guys from... Uh, you know, from the SEC, uh, the, the lady lawyer from the SEC, a guy from Homeland Security, and a guy from the FBI, and they've got 32 people. They're arresting some in the United States, uh, and these are guys that apparently were front-running the market with inside information that was gained through hacking. Now, you know, 
Who knows? But I, I know in talking to Danny McAdams uh, of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, how many false flags, and we go over history, how many false flags have been raised in order to get the American people on side of the ruling elite that wants another war. So who knows what's going on. We have currency wars, and we could have hot wars, I suppose, that are related to that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the manipulation of, of the silver markets. So you, you're talking here, you, you've had several things on your, on your blog in the last couple of days about the silver markets. You had one article that says there's a problem in the silver market, and you mentioned in the article that there is an unintended consequence of the United States government's efforts to drive physical and gold uh, out of the system. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, the unintended consequences? Well, I mean, what's happened here, and I assume everyone who's listening to, to your show understands that the price of gold and silver is being manipulated with, with paper gold and silver, primarily yes. on the COMEX. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it's, it's an artificial takedown of the price of gold. And what's happening is, is China and India are saying, great, drive it lower, we'll buy more. I mean, it, it's no coincidence that since they've been driving down the price of silver, all of a sudden India shifted some of their importing of gold into importing of silver, and they're on track to import a record amount of silver this year. And this is, this is physical silver that has to be delivered. I mean, it, it, would, it would spoil the, the scheme if all of a sudden India announced to the world that there's several Western banks that aren't delivering the silver that India paid for, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one thing to suspend sales from the U.S. Mint. Who cares? Boo-hoo. You know, <laughs> mom and yeah. America are going to have to wait a while to get their silver eagles. But when you're talking about massive quantities of physical gold and silver that China and India are buying... You can't default on that. So I think part of what's happened, and you know, you have the, the in at almost for almost every silver producer, the, the market price of silver is below their cost of production. So you've got silver production is declining, and so you, you've had not only have you had increased demand for physical gold and silver, you've had a decline in the amount that's being produced. I mean, high cost gold mines have been being shuttered for the last few years, and what it's done is it's 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 created a shortage of silver, and we're starting to see visible evidence of that. I mean, that the Mint had to suspend production of Silver Eagles. And uh-huh. by law, constitutionally, they're supposed to produce enough silver to meet demand. And I think it was, I don't know, five, four or five years ago, it was all supposed to be produced from U.S. silver, and they had to open up production or open up that silver pool to silver that they've been importing from Mexico in order to meet demand. Mm. Yeah. And then um, there had been rumors going around that the Canadian Mint was starting to run out of, of inventory and supply, and a friend of mine had bought a 10-ounce silver, a Royal Canadian Mint silver bar from a, a, an Internet bullion dealer, and they had his check, his check cleared, he waited another few days, and he got an email that said they can't send him the bar because they don't have it, and the Royal Canadian Mint has stopped production of it. Huh. Well, and the, the only reason they would have stopped production of this bar is because they needed to save silver blanks to keep producing silver maple leaves, right? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. there was no news announcement that they stopped producing this bar, but if, when they stopped producing silver maple leaves, everyone knows about it. Sure. So... To me, that's that's another visible sign that we're starting to see physical supply shortages in gold and silver, and that plus the fact that um, gold and silver, the price of gold and silver has been in backwardation in London now for several weeks. And yeah, what so- that means is that the spot price is higher than the future price, which means that people will pay more to to buy gold or silver and have it in hand now rather than pay a future price that's lower than the spot price and wait 30 days t- in order to have it delivered. It means that the market doesn't trust that that gold or silver will definitely be delivered. So it's, it's sort of the bird in hand is worth more than two in the bush type scenario. Sure, sure. And, and those kinds of situations beg for arbitrage to take away the difference. And if that isn't happening, then it's really suggesting there must be a shortage, I would think. Because you shouldn't have that kind of prolonged uh, situation. You shouldn't have that sort of um, situation lasting for long, should you? 
That's exactly right. And in terms of the real unintended consequence here, and it's something that um, this was one of GATA's founding premises, as you well know, you know, back in late 90s, early 2000s, was that eventually the paper scheme to, to manipulate the price of gold is going to get overwhelmed by a shortage of physical gold and silver, and the price of physical gold and silver are going to blow away the paper price. And I don't know when that's going to happen, but it's possible that we might be seeing the beginnings of that now. I mean, I, I think we started to see it in 2008. Mm -hmm. And the price of gold and silver ran up quite a bit. And I think that that cut off a lot of demand and it also um, stimulated mine supply, et cetera. So, sure. Um, but now they've driven it down. We're not back quite back at those levels, but they've driven it down, you know, a significant amount again. It's it's stimulated all kinds of demand, and and some of the demand that we're seeing that wasn't there in 08 is obviously demand from China and increased demand from India. I think, like I said, I think India is on pace to import. They're for sure on pace to import a record amount of silver this year, and I think they're now on pace to import a record amount of gold. India so it's, it's got to be stressing out the physical supply of gold and silver, and I, I think at some point it's you're, we're, we'll wake up one day, and, and both the, the, the price of gold and silver will be a lot higher. And it's it's you know when you go out and try to buy some, you're going to have to wait a long time to get delivery. Well, as long as they can convince enough people that are in the futures markets to uh, not to worry that it'll be there, as long as that con game can continues, I suppose. But you know, Dave, when we get a sort of a shakeout in the markets like we're getting now, I would imagine there's some people that are selling whatever they're able to sell and not necessarily what they want to sell. And that could also put a bit of a lid on, uh, on gold and silver on the upside. But uh, I note today... I'm not sure where it's at now, but earlier today with the equity markets getting hammered really hard and the high yield markets also, uh, you know, money flowing back into treasuries uh, and also uh, gold was holding up very well. In fact, it was up a bit today for the most part. So maybe do you think we might have uh, we might be in a bottoming process here finally for gold and for silver? Or who I knows? Think it's, I think it's a real distinct possibility, and and your previous guess. Michael Oliver was talking about that, and, and I completely agree with what he's saying. And that is, you know, if the markets have topped and we get a, a, a massive sell-off in the stock in equities, we're going to see the inverse happen with gold and silver and mining stocks. And that's exactly what happened in 2008 and 2009. Gold and silver bottomed in mid to late October. And right around that time, the S&P 500 started selling off. It actually started selling off before that, um, and gold and silver sold off with it. But then they bottomed in October, and they started moving up again. And the S&P didn't hit a, a final bottom until, I think it was mid-March or mid-April in 2009. And the, the only reason it bottomed is because of the massive money printing that the Fed sure. engaged in. Sure. And I don't remember the exact magnitude of the moves in gold and silver, but I know the Huey index ran from 150, I think it bottomed at 150 in the first couple of days of November, and it hit 300 by the end of December. And then that's the kind of moves that I think we're going to see again if, if, in fact, they're starting to lose control of their ability to prop up the stock market. Well, we're certainly what we certainly saw in 2008, 2009 was the real price of gold rising relative to commodities, relative to the Rogers Fund, which is what I watch very carefully. And with that, then went the profits of the major mining companies. They rose very dramatically, and of course, gold was rising very dramatically too, along with QE and the stock market, both very well linked to the increase in the monetary reserves, until the United States uh, Treasuries were downgraded by S&P in uh, 2011, I think it was around August. One month later, gold got slammed extremely hard, and then from then went down. But of course, the equity market continued to move up, along with quantitative easing. So I can't help but think that that was, there was more than just a coincidence that the gold market was, <laughs> was smacked down exactly at the time the S&P said, wait a minute, in the minds of many investors, perhaps uh, perhaps the dollar isn't as good as gold. Well, whoa, gold is 
is going up, the equity market's going down, and I'm just wondering if something like that might not be uh, in the cards right now. Again, we have about one minute, but I wanted to ask you, in, in closing here, Dave, you know, uh, you had mentioned uh, the provenant metals situation. Was that what you were referring to a minute ago about the Yes. The okay, yes. and then you're also saying that people really need to be careful when they're buying these metals online. I guess that's, that's what you're suggesting. So where should people go if, they're, if they really need to be sure? I, I guess uh, probably the Sprott uh, people would be good to go to. I don't know. What, what's your suggestion? Well, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything negative about Provident other than the fact yeah. that they had represented that they had these bars in inventory, and they uh-huh. didn't. They were waiting uh-huh. for their shipment from the Royal Canadian Mint, which never showed up. But my yeah. friend bought the bar from them because he, they said they had it in inventory. And that's a common practice. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't think these companies should be doing that, but they do. Yeah. I just think you need to be really careful. I mean, All right, Dave. Uh, our, we ha- we, we do have bought, to go. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, our fund bought, you know, several million dollars worth of bullion from Tolving, and we never had a problem. And then yeah. all of a sudden, Tolving goes bankrupt. Yeah. And that's that's how it happens. And I think All the right. only way to really be safe is just to say, okay, I'm going to pay up. I'm going to pay up in premium and I'm going to walk into a local coin dealer and get it and, get the and metal. buy walk from them and I can walk. walk out with it in my pocket. All right, Dave, we have to go. We're out of time. Thank you very much for being with us. We'll like to do it again sometime in the near Thanks, future. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. it. 